Hi, I'm George, and this week we're going to have a look at a flight computer that was developed by our friend and fellow water rocketeer Daniel from Finland. Uh, he sent us the Rev1 version of his board to see if we can fly it on our rockets. Uh, now, he actually sent it about four months ago, but because of the lockdowns, we haven't been able to get out to the club launch site until this last weekend. So let's have a look how it did and what sort of tests we did with it. Here's a close-up of the flight computer. It's quite small at around 60 millimeters by 28 and it only weighs eight grams. We first soldered a couple of headers to it so that we could connect the battery and the servo motor. The flight computer has a barometric pressure sensor, accelerometer and gyroscopes so that the data is logged from these to a micro SD card that you plug into the bottom. Daniel includes a good set of instructions on GitHub as well as a YouTube video that shows you how to use it. Once the battery is connected, we see one of the really nice design features that it's built-in battery charger. You can just plug it into a USB source and charge the battery that way. The other nice thing is that the board generates a 5 volt rail from a single lithium polymer battery so that you can easily power common RC servo motors from it. The flight computer can be flown in both timer mode and auto apogee detecting mode. For the full range of configuration options, have a look at Daniel's website. I've left links to his website and video in the description. With the servo motor connected, we did a quick bench test. You simply power it on and then trigger the launch detect. And the servo motor moves after a certain delay. Bench testing is one thing, but how does it behave in the real world? So we took it out to the launch site. Before testing it with the actual parachute, we first wanted to see how it behaved itself in flight. We attached it to a short strip of quarry fluid and attached a separate servo motor and a camera as well. We lined up the camera so that it could see the flight computer, the servo motor, as well as the horizon. This way, we would know what the flight computer was doing in relation to the rocket's position in the world. For the first couple of test flights, we used our servo timer for parachute deployment. Here you can see the position of the servo motor, and here is the flight computer LED, and you can also see in what mode it is. The camera also records any beeps coming from the flight computer. For this flight, we are flying the flight computer in mode B, the timer mode with a delay set for 5 seconds. Four, three, so two, let's launch it. One, go. As you can see, the flight computer had detected launch, and five seconds later, it moved the servo. So this test was a success. Let's have a look at the data from that flight. The flight computer saves each flight to a CSV file that can then be opened with Excel, and you can also plot any graphs there if you want. We are, however, going to use our Fuse app to look at the data as it makes it easier to inspect. Here are the angles from the gyros in pitch, yaw and roll. Here is the acceleration and here is the temperature. This is the altitude converted to feet. We see that the altitude is vertically offset by a significant amount. I'm not exactly sure why that is, but it may have something to do with how the launch was triggered perhaps. In any case, we can easily correct for that offset by putting the landing altitude at zero, and then we get the actual altitude of 427 feet. So let's try the flight computer in the auto apogee detecting mode. For this flight, we also added an altimeter one so that we could compare the altitude from the commercial altimeter with Daniel's flight computer. The rocket was launched at the same pressure again. This time we're looking for the servo to activate automatically as soon as the rocket goes through Apogee. And we can see that the servo activated right when it should have. So this was also a successful test. So let's have a quick look at the data from this flight. 
And again, we see that the altitude plot is offset. So if we fix it, we get a peak altitude of 442 feet. Now comparing that with the altimeter one reading of 437 feet, we get a pretty close match, meaning that the flight computer is correctly measuring the peak altitude. If we have a look at the acceleration data, it's quite interesting because after landing, you can see where Paul had picked up the rocket and was walking back to the table. You can see each of his steps. In the roll data, you can see these little waves. These were caused by the rocket rolling around its axis under parachute. Since the two test flights were successful, we connected the flight computer to the deploy mechanism servo motor so that the flight computer could now deploy the parachute. We also removed the camera just in case there was a crash we didn't want it to get damaged. You normally would want to mount this on the inside of the nose cone, but hey, sometimes a dodgy solution is the quickest. Here we're doing a quick test in the timer mode to make sure that the flight computer is correctly configured to move the servo in the right direction. For the actual test flight, we decided to go with the auto apogee detection mode. So here we go. As you can see, the parachute opened just past apogee as expected. So that was the third successful flight. For the last test flight of the day, we switched the flight computer to the timer mode and set the delay for five seconds. And this is that flight. Two, one, go! <laughs> the parachute came out on time again, but because I didn't pack it properly, one of the shroud lines was crossed over yeah, it's all, it's all and the parachute tangled. So this was also a successful it, flight computer flight, despite the hard landing. No damage was done to any of the electronics. Here is a plot of the data from all four flights comparing the altitude. They all went to a similar altitude, because the rocket had the same pressure. And you can see the fourth flight that had a steeper descent uh, because of the tangled parachute. So what is our overall verdict? We think that this flight computer is very good and certainly worked well in all of our tests. The fact that Daniel provides the full source code and circuit diagrams makes this a platform that you can extend for many different purposes. Getting data off the flight computer is trivial and you don't need special cables. We really like the built-in charger as well. Some things we think that could be improved with a simple firmware update include the fact you can't really tell that it's turned on. You know you turned it on, but if you later want to check a part of your pre-launch checklist, there is no indication. A short flash every few seconds from the LED or a short chirp from the speaker would work well for that. Also in the timer mode, you can't tell what the time setting is after you turn it on. Again, perhaps the LED could flash out the number of seconds the timer is set to. And lastly, Daniel has covered the barometric sensor to protect it from direct sunlight, as direct sunlight can give you a noisy data, but when it's standing on its end, you can get direct sunlight sneaking in under the cover. We thought this might be a problem, and so we simply put a piece of black tape over it. If it is inside an opaque body tube inside the rocket, then that's not an issue at all. So thanks again, Daniel. We'll definitely be using it in some upcoming experiments. Uh, the data logging capability is really good, so we'll definitely be using that. Uh, and we might even have a go at modifying some of the software on it because of its open platform to uh, support those experiments. During the same launch, we also did another experiment with the intervalometer we showed you last week. Uh, we added an external trigger and that allows us to take a picture after a set amount of time and we can adjust the delay in terms of milliseconds. So let's have a look what we did with it. We set the camera up on a tripod a short distance away from the rocket. We wanted to get a close up of the bottom part of the rocket and nozzle in flight soon as it left the launch rail. The night before, we looked at a video of a previous launch of the same rocket and measured how long it took from the time of launch to get to the position where we wanted it. This was around 160 milliseconds. And so we set this time on the timer. To trigger the timer, we attached a remote switch to the launcher. This switch can be placed under a fin so that as soon as the rocket starts moving, it can trigger the timer. So we pressurized and launched the rocket.
And this is the picture we got. The timing and framing was right, but we used autofocus, which didn't do a great job. So for the next launch, we set it up on manual focus, and I had Paul hold up a bottle at the location so I could focus on it. So the rocket was launched again, and this is the picture we got. Again, the framing was spot on, and this time the focus was much better. For the next picture, we wanted to get the whole rocket in the frame and a little bit further above the launcher. And so we first set up the manual focus for about that distance that we were going to shoot, and then pointed the camera further up. You're probably thinking, why not just capture a frame from a video of the launch? But the big difference is the much better resolution we can get from the single photo, which is 6,000 by 4,000 pixels. We set the delay to 200 milliseconds for this one, and here's the shot we got. We'd love to hear any suggestions in the comments below on how best we could use this capability. So that's it for this week. It was sure nice to get out to the launch site again after such a long pause. In the next video, we'll go back to the Horizon project and see the progress there. Until then, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.